RC here, and today we will be responding to this guy. Today I have seven signs you'll be an atheist one day. But Let's see what we gotta deal with, and that these signs really will make you an atheist. But first, roll that intro. This is another response to the internet atheists, and if you haven't seen the one responding to the non sequitur collab, check that one out in the description below. Mr. Atheist did this collab, and I'm only going to respond to four of these, since three are things that I do agree with, like this first one, that is, being, you avoid the god questions that bother you, which makes sense since people who do that constantly will have doubts about their faith and become an atheist. Most atheist testimony videos and books usually have that as one of the central narratives. Plus, Pologia's question about proving it with science is another one because while it's not as effective as the other, and you'll still likely be a Christian, others who've tried this have become an atheist as a result. So my main answer is that we should get apologetics at a basic level taught in the churches as well as a Bible study so that others may learn to answer the God questions and even learn from scholars like Heiser, Walton, and Longman III and others who point out that we shouldn't view the Bible as a scientifically accurate book, but instead a book aimed to teach theology while utilizing the knowledge of the ancient Near East and first century church Christians at that time. So, that being said, let's at least start with the second one. Number two, you listen. No, like really, you listen. You actually listen to your opponent when they speak. One of the signs of dogmatic thinking is affirmation seeking. When engaging in dialogue, instead of being interested in and considering the position that's being presented, instead you're looking for holes, for opportunities to assert your perspective and refute the opposition. Once you become more open to the possibility that your position is as fallible as you are, the perspective can shift. Instead of wanting an opportunity to present your case and reinforce your existing perspective, you become more interested in challenging it. Instead of just affirmation, you seek the opportunity to scrutinize and criticize your beliefs. When this paradigm shift takes place, an interlocutor is no longer perceived as an opponent. Instead, they are a means by which to be exposed to an imposing perspective, to challenge yourself and ensure your positions are sound and reasonable and justified. This can begin to place you into the perspective of the opposing side. When this happens, more often than not, you start to honestly admit to yourself that it's reasonable and it makes sense. This may not always lead to deconversion itself, but it tears down some important walls. Instead of being closed, you're opened, and that means that you have to ask yourself some really hard questions. So when I really listen to my opponents in debates, or when engaging in their skepticism, such as what is demonstrated in the Ask RCA shows that occur every Friday, I may encounter questions I need to look into sometimes, but that certainly doesn't mean my faith is in doubt or jeopardy. For instance, in my debate with Godless Engineer, he asked a question that did stump me and I wasn't as researched on. Then when I went to do the research, I saw evidence that shows a stronger affirmation of the Christian faith than what I used to have. So, in other words, I became much more confident in my faith that I could easily answer questions. So I would recommend this, and in fact, recent apologetic books actually demand that the New Age of Apologetics uh, do this in order to advance uh, this cause, because it helps strengthen your faith and points out the flaws in what the other one believes as well. So yes, totally do what Shannon just recommended here. Number three. You don't take your holy book literally. You might slowly find yourself turning into an atheist, or at the very least, a religious non, if you have a habit of not taking your holy book literally for whatever reason. Let's take the Bible for instance. If you start out from a strong position and then slowly start finding yourself backpedaling every single time you find that one of the claims in the Bible can't be justified as a literal claim, you'll find that the more times you have to throw something into the bucket of metaphor, the more bricks you're tearing down around your faith. If you think of your faith as a brick building, every single time you take part of your faith and translate it into metaphor, 
you are taking one of those bricks away. Eventually, you'll be left with nothing more than a foundation to build up from. And now that you've already discarded all of the old bricks and metaphors, you might not be using the same type of bricks to rebuild your house. After all, why did you get rid of them in the first place? How many pieces and parts of your faith do you have to strip away before the faith simply isn't there anymore? On that, how much of your faith is directly tied to the literature of your faith? If so much of your faith relies on that literature, and you start discarding the literature, what truly is left? You just might find that when rebuilding these walls for your metaphorical house, you might not be left with the same perspective as you had before where the walls once stood. Now, I agree the perspective might not be the same, but not as an atheist. The problem here is that it assumes that finding metaphors in the Bible is something problematic, when it is instead just studying and analyzing the literature perfectly well in light of genre and following the rules of language in the Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. For example, Psalms and Proverbs fall under the wisdom literature category and do show clear usage of symbolic or metaphorical language at times. However, we do have to know when it is and when it isn't. Which is why, again, learning how to exegete the Bible is something we will need to learn. And when we read any Old Testament introduction book or individual commentary on the Old Testament, for example, we can learn its genre and why it's labeled as such. So if we examine and exegete the Bible consistently, then we won't deal with any problem. To use a real life example, there is a C.S. Lewis multi-works uh, volume book that, exa that exists out there among his classics. Not everything in there is trying to relay uh, literalism. In fact, actually, one book is a fictional parable called The Screwtape Letters. So we must find out what is metaphor in this collection of books and what's not. The Bible is a mix of 66 different books with multiple genres, so likewise, we must understand what is going on as we exegete scripture in light of its literary context. Number four, you love science. If your flirtation with science extends beyond the occasional TED talk to a truly curious mindset, your inquisitive pilgrimage will invariably lead you on a quest for answers. At some point in this journey, you'll begin to realize that the universe is knowable. Not in a new age anthropomorphic personified way, but knowable in the sense that we can and are uncovering how it works. And science is the method for how we investigate its inner workings. Like reverse engineering a foreign contraption, science asks how? and then sets about to find out. In neuroscience, you realize that seizures, sleep paralysis, and schizophrenia have chemical causes and aren't demon possession. Studying biology, genetics, and biochemistry, you'll learn how we know that all animals are related and that we're animals, that life is nothing more than chemistry, and that it can arise from non-life naturally. Anthropology, dendrochronology, and geology will show you how we know that the Earth is far older than most ancient religions could even fathom. Cracking into physics, you'll discover how particles pop into and out of existence ex nihilo, from nothing, and observe how even entire stars and planets can form entirely on their own. The more you fill in your gaps of understanding, the less room is left for magical supernatural forces. And as more and more of your supernatural beliefs fade into your cognitive graveyard of scientifically illiterate misconceptions, you'll realize how many times you've been wrong with the assertion, we don't know, therefore God, as your placeholder for ignorance, and you become comfortable with, we may not know yet, but perhaps we can find out together. This is not a surprise that such a foolish sign would come from him considering that this question that he asked one time of the non sequitur. Truth doesn't fear curiosity, testing, or doubt, which inoculate us against charlatans and scams. But if your beliefs stand up to scrutiny, then why is doubting Thomas vilified as the bad guy for utilizing the scientific method, while the rest of the disciples are congratulated for following like blind sheep? So yeah, I've wondered what he thought about scientists like Francis Collins, John Polkinghorne, Asa Gray, Francis Bacon, Alistair McGrath. Robert of Sentinel Apologetics, 
and many others who are scientists to some degree that are Christians. And then we have those who love science as fans of it. People who study science and are going to get their degrees. Again, this is just a non sequitur. That loving science is a sign that you'll somehow logically become an atheist someday. The three Old Testament scholars that I named earlier recognize that there is not much scientifically accurate facts in the Bible and can believe evolution is true while the Bible Bible doesn't give us that info. In fact, here's something from Heiser. God chose to communicate his message through ancient people who held pre-scientific beliefs. He chose not to correct those beliefs because teaching correct science wasn't the aim of scripture. The aim of scripture was to tell the Israelites and everyone thereafter who God was and what their relationship was with him. Just as Joe could see past Mandy's ignorance and get to the real truth of the message, modern people are able to read scripture and parse out antiquated ideas about science. So even if parts of the Bible contain outdated information about the physical world, we can still trust it for the truths that God really wanted to communicate. How does this work in scripture? Let's look at a psalm about creation. The Holy Spirit wanted everyone to know that Yahweh, the God of Israel, created the world. So he inspired a psalmist to communicate that idea. Since the psalmist was an ancient person, he thought the earth was flat and that it sat upon physical foundations. So when he wrote about creation, it ended up like this. He established the earth upon its foundations so that it will not totter forever and ever. The psalmist accomplished what the Holy Spirit wanted. He accredited creation to Yahweh in a way his contemporaries would understand. It would have been pointless for God to explain to the psalmist that the world is actually a sphere floating in the void of space. Even if the psalmist could grasp the idea, it would have meant nothing to his ancient audience. They didn't know what outer space was. When modern people read this psalm, they can immediately see past the pre-scientific notions and still understand the message. Number six. You know your faith foundation is only good enough for you. You acknowledge that your God belief is only based on personal experience. I grew up as religious as they come. I believed it with all of my heart and it was the core thing about me. It was the center of my personality. And at a certain point between being totally religious and atheist, I realized that the reasons why I believed those things that I felt were what atheists often refer to as anecdotal evidence. These were personal experiences that I had identified as religious experiences because of influence of other people's stories. I, I took what I had heard of people in similar circumstances and assumed that the conclusion they came to for their experience was the same I came to. Growing up religious, I thought I felt the Holy Ghost. And that was certainly the thing that stuck out the most to me, that I had had witness born to me. And then the day came when I couldn't explain a lot of the things that I admitted were inconsistent and seemed strange about a world with a loving God, but I just knew it was the case. And this was one of my steps toward losing my religion. Losing my religion. When I finally realized my reasons for believing weren't good enough for anybody besides me. And finally, the day came where I had to acknowledge that the reasons why I believed were really only good reasons for me, or at least I thought so at the time. I'm not gonna lie. I agree with this. So if somebody holds their faith only being good enough for them, then that is subjective and shows they can't demonstrably prove or convince others of their faith. I can understand that some say arguments are only good enough for them because multiple arguments exist for certain issues, but the multiple arguments ultimately end up proving the same thing. That's why I'm not going to touch on this one that as much. But I will at least take the time to say this to Mr. Atheist. How about showing a video that really puts the nail in the coffin of Christianity? Maybe then I can respond to something you have to offer from your own words. Number seven, you're a little obsessed with debating atheists. You spend a little too much time debating atheists. Once trivial and routine things such as scrolling through your social media newsfeed have now become an obsessive hunt for someone or something that you disagree with. People who are confident in their belief or who have no doubt in their faith, don't pay any attention to anything atheists have to say. These conversations trigger you. Now, why is that? 
Well, if we're 100% honest with each other, it's because you have doubts too. And that's okay. Our brains are hardwired to be curious, to ask questions, and to seek the answers to those questions. Religion tries to extinguish those sparks, instead dampening it with verses from ancient books telling you to trust and obey and that faith is all that you need. When you confront us, you're really confronting yourself. When you demand that we give you evidence that there is no God, you're really just grasping at evidence for your own. When you try to convince us to believe, you're really just trying to convince yourself. Hearing us talk about being skeptical, asking questions, pointing out contradictions, that's like pouring gas on that mind. We engage you because we see those sparks, curiosity, and doubt. We are not your enemy. Instead, think of us like a flint. We engage your arguments, waiting, hoping for that one strike that sends a spark into that curiosity and doubt, igniting the flames that burn away that barricade that religion has put up, freeing you to finally seek the answers to the questions that you have, and not some ancient book. I see. So Kyle, you are part of this too. Et tu, Kale? I'm just kidding, that was obviously terrible. But in all seriousness, let's actually examine this. So, debating atheists and having these curious sparks is a sign of becoming an atheist? Why is it then that Hunter of Sentinel Apologetics was able to do this as a militant atheist and then at the same time become a Christian as a result? If anything, this is just a sign of one becoming a Christian as well. But anyways, debating atheists is just a sign of evangelism. It shows we care enough to witness to you while answering your questions. In fact, John Frame, who is a theologian and reformed apologist, says the following in his book on apologetics, says, quote, Allow me to draw the application that evangelism is part of apologetics, as the reverse is also true perspectively. The apologist must always be ready to present the gospel. He must not get tangled up in arguments, proofs, defenses, and critiques that he neglects to give the unbeliever what he needs most. So simply put, my view of this is that we as Christians will debate not because we see it as a means to destroy and win the arguments to make you atheists look silly and dumb, but because we love and care to show where you error and why you need the gospel of Jesus Christ who saves us sinners from the wrath of God and that those who believe in him will not perish but have eternal life. That is what we are aiming to do. So ultimately, this is my response to all of you is that just because there are these certain signs, quote-unquote, that exist, doesn't mean that we'll automatically become atheists anytime soon, but rather that this thing could be applied to the reverse and instead show that we will instead become Christians if we start off as atheists with this route. So, these are poorly devised uh, signs besides the two or three that was mentioned. So, that being said, this has been RC Apologist. Have a good day.